Hello, I'm mischievous Mark Chinacchio, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Fantasy 15, and of course, all of the Amazing Spider-Man annuals, which of course, don't count. And I'm Dapper Dan Gavazdan. I'm bi-coastal, and I own every issue of Amazing Spider-Man, including the annuals, which I say definitely count. But for me, Amazing Fantasy 15 remains a fantasy. And Mark, I say by coastal because anybody watching the video version of this is going to see all these boxes and bare walls behind me because I'm moving back to the East Coast, back to Baltimore uh, to be closer to you, Mark. I keep telling everybody I'm moving closer to my family, but let's be real. It's really to get closer to you, Mark. Amazing spider talk in one time zone. Whoever thought it was going to be possible again, Dan? Um, I, I certainly it, didn't. It's been a decade since that since that was true, um, which, which is to say it was very rarely true. It was like what for two, two or three years it was true, and it, now it's not. Um, but uh, it, it will be true again, and Mark and I will be back to a more normal schedule of recordings, which imagine the possibilities, Mark. Uh, Imagine the possibilities. But in the meantime, we welcome you to this bi-coastal version of The Amazing Spider Talk, the show where two fans and collectors uncover the strange, fun, and fascinating history of the Spider-Man comic universe. Thanks for joining us for this review episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. And uh, that is to say, next week, I will probably not be on the show, and I will be replaced by available Alan Shurstall, which uh, I think is like a net gain for the show, honestly. Uh, it's been too long since uh, he was on board this show. It's been like, what, like 50 episodes at the very least since we've had Alan on, which is far too long uh, uh, given Alan's uh, familiarity with the show. It just means more jokes about you and solicits, Dan, while you're not around. So uh, <laughs> gird your loins, uh, listeners. I do think in that time, Mark, you have become a bit of a solicit king. So, you know, like, uh, we'll see. Uh, but anyway, if you want to swing along with us on our journey through Spidey's past, present, and future, subscribe to Amazing Spider Talk on your favorite podcast app and leave us a review to help spread the word about our show. Uh, this podcast exists because of the support of our Patreon members. If you want to receive early episodes, exclusive artwork, and keep this podcast going, Go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and consider joining our Patreon. Now, Mark, normally on an anniversary uh, episode, I list off like a dozen creators to form up the backbone of uh, like who makes the comic because mm -hmm. Lord knows one artist team couldn't handle it. But this mm. is one of those weird instances where the, the anniversary number 50 kind of landed solidly with uh, like a, a solid art team. But issue 51, the one we're talking about today is kind of a mixed bag, a little all over the place in terms of creators here. So this is, today we're going to be discussing Amazing Spider-Man, Volume 6, Number 51. It was written by Zeb Wells. The cover features artwork by Ed McGinnis and Marcio Menez. The interior pages feature pencils by Ed McGinnis and Todd Nock. Inks by Mark Farmer, Todd Nock, Cliff Wraithburn, and Wade Von Grawbadger. There's that name. And There's colors by Marcio Menez, Eric Arseniega, Brian Valenza, and of course, letters by the one-man band known as VC's Joe Caramagna. This issue was first released on June 5th, 2024. That's a lot of inkers and colorists uh, to put this issue together. Well, last week on the show, we commended the kickoff to this final Goblin story of the Wells run. But I suggested that I couldn't really judge my full thoughts on it until we got to see the Spider Goblin in action, right? Because he was kind of teased, and I think a lot of the internet had been really like kind of hesitant to embrace the idea of the Spider Goblin. I think my reaction was, are we really doing this again so soon? Um, but uh, I, I was curious to see what truly distinguished this character from the story we got in Spidey's first hunt. So, Mark, what did you think of the Spider Goblin? And do you think there's enough of a new concept here to once again dip into the realm of an evil Spider-Man? <sighs> well, I mean, I think visually there's a lot of fun things going on here, courtesy of Ed McGinnis. But, like, conceptually and thematically, it, it this... This comic felt a lot of, lot of uh, samesies to me uh, from what we got during the the Gleason run, and, you know, and without kind of the, the the 
dark methodical nature to it that made that story a little more cerebral and kind of like JMD Mike Zek esque, if you will. Um, so yeah, it, 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 for me personally, it, it felt very rote and kind of repetitive, but I, I, am I being too close minded here, Dan? What did you think? No, I don't think you are. I think, but you also highlighted something that's a little bit different. This is not the cerebral take that we yeah. got. Um, you know, I, I think we characterized the first hunt sinister Spider-Man as like a expression of like Peter's ego in some way or his like repressed thoughts that became manifest. And, you know, why the soul of the sins versus the mind of the goblin result in two wildly different interpretations of goblinized Peter is something I don't know that I'm going to understand but I do think they do enough here to at least suggest the distinguish like character between this. Like this is very much not about Peter Parker, at least not yet. It feels very much like it's just the goblin in a Spider-Man suit, uh, mm-hmm. you know, that, and, and it's like, a, a, you know, a ex- further extension of Norman's reach vis-a-vis Spider-Man and his powers. And it's, appropriately silly, which is why I think Ed McGinnis is kind of a good pairing for this is like his goblin is very gobliny and arched back and curled fingers and making jokes and like smiling and posing in, in creepy ways. And, um, you know, I think visually is where it's most successful, but I appreciated that there was enough of a distinction here in the characterization that it's not just like another repressed Peter lashing out at the world around him. Yeah, no, I get that. I guess, I guess for me though, it's like, should this be silly, Dan? I mean, I, I, you know, like on, on its face, I mean, like this is a pretty horrific thing, transformation that has happened to Spider-Man. And yet like, yeah, it does feel kind of like we're playing it for laughs. I mean, I guess like the only element from a, from a silliness standpoint that I think was kind of akin to that was when, in, in the, in the last story with Gleason was like when he was like going after Paul, like there was definitely kind of a, uh, a, a, a dark sardonic edge to that. I felt like, um, which, you know, is kind of amplified to the, you know, umpteenth power here, but like, I guess that's part of it. It's like, I, I, I feel like, this comic is playing it for like the cheapest elements of the characterization and you know whereas like yeah i i didn't want to i don't think we want to see the exact same story all over again but it's like if we're just kind of boiling it down to like the cheap points and then not really giving it any depth i don't know if that's any better i don't know i am i making sense it just it just like something wasn't connecting on this for me i i wanted I don't know if I wanted more, but I was I I wasn't I wasn't like really into it, I guess. Yeah, no, I think it's a much shallower interpretation yeah. of this concept than than like having the psychological like JMD elements, you know. This is a like a very distinct interpretation of the goblin, you know, like this is not JMD's goblin that will invite, you know, Peter and MJ and normie to dinner over a table this is a cackling you know uh joker-esque goblin um who is kind of sillier and i think some writers have leaned into that version of the goblin i don't know that many have been quite this silly maybe like paul jenkins maybe uh, you know um but it's definitely a distinct take on the goblin whether you agree with it, whether it lines up with the historical way the goblin has been interpreted over the years. Yeah. And, and, you know, I mean, what about the fact that like y- you kind of indicated this earlier that like there's very li- little Peter to be found here. I mean, did, what did, did that, did that upset you at all? I mean, did you, did you have any take on that? I mean, it does bum me out that we're getting another Spidey story in this run that doesn't, foreground Peter Parker. I mean, maybe, maybe it will ultimately there will be more of a Peter focus to this. Um, you know, we're going to talk about it later, but the inclusion of chasm here, like suggests to me, like that maybe this will be focused on 
you know, uh, alternate spiders, you know, standing up to this. Um, but it would be a shame if, the, you know, this just ended up being like a Norman Goblin plus one, you know, in the form of Peter Parker as the Goblin. Um, you know, uh, maybe that characterization will come out more distinctly and maybe this kind of sillier, jokier Goblin is a result of it being Peter as the Goblin. Um, and maybe putting the two goblins in the same room will draw out that distinction. Um, but right now it does feel like, you know, it, it is missing exactly what you were saying earlier is the, like by making him the goblin, it could give us insight into who Peter Parker is, which I think Spidey's first hunt did. Like it was yeah. like, this is really what the, the turmoil that's going inside of Peter expressed as rage, you know? Um, and that's not entirely clear right now. Um, so uh, I, I do. I, you were hinting at it, and I agree with your suggestion, which is here's another story where Peter is not the driving force of the action. Right. And and, and I, I think you kind of calling it a, a shallow version of the story is, is very accurate, too. I mean, like, it, it, it's not it's not objectively bad in any way, but it's just like I, I, I feel like you know we're 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 distilling this concept down in, into its very simplest form and and we're going to get how many how many issues is this arc is this a four part arc or a three part arc i think it's a five part arc five part arc okay so <laughs> well cuz it's I got mean, the 50th issue so that doubles up and that'll be a trade right there there you go there you go i mean like you know it's it's yeah, I mean, like, I'm, I'm not, I, I, that, that actually concerns me greatly because I'm like, I don't, I don't see five parts of story here. You know what I mean? Like, this just feels like, you know, I, I, you know, I guess, I guess there are some twists and turns with Kazan coming up, but like, I, 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 I this is going to get very, very tired very fast if it's just this version of the Spider Goblin for the next three to four issues. You know what I mean? Like, it just doesn't really, have a lot of depth to it it's just kind of like oh okay yeah now he's gonna you know like you know is he gonna is he gonna squeeze is he gonna crack mysterio's fishbowl open is he gonna squeeze craven's head okay i mean like we kind of played with that a little bit in the gleason story but like again it was done with a little bit more um sophistication than this so this just kind of like oh, okay yeah, yeah like you said very joker-esque um what about... I do think, like, if this is a story about putting the, like, uh, toys back in the box, so to speak, for the end of the Wells run, which is all but telegraphed at this point, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. all but printed in, in, you know, in a solicit. Um, you know, there is still a lot of elements here. Like, I mean, if anything, I felt like this felt like a kind of a crowded issue. It's like Chasm's going to come back in and... I imagine we're going to see some conclusion to that. I know there's like a chasm mini series that's coming out, but this feels like a way for Wells to bring him back and solve that. We've got to get Peter healed in time for the tombstone arc. You know, we've got whatever Norman's final status quo is going on here and the living brain and the sinister six. It's a lot of players. So, yeah, you know, I do feel like there's enough chess pieces on the board here to not have to solely rely on the spider goblin characterization as something to pad it out to five issues, but we'll see. I've been a very bad prognosticator of the quality and focus of this series in the past. Uh, but I will say we get a look out from electro in this issue. And, uh, you, you know, I chalked, I wrote that one on my tally board. Uh, I was going to say, I didn't, I didn't spell it out in the recap and I, I, I apologize to you for that, Dan. I didn't give you that moment of glory to, to, to put it on the board. Well, what did you think of the the Sinister Six fight? I mean, we've seen a lot of like Sinister Six versus Spider Man, and they've had some altercations against the Goblin in the past, who has expressly not been a member of the Sinister Six over the years. Although you know, various versions of him have been slotted onto the team, and I guess you could say he ran the Sinister Twelve in yeah, the, the Mark Millar. The, yeah. Right. Um, so, what do you think about seeing this kind of face off? Did you buy? That uh, that a goblinified Peter w could take out the Sinister Six like this. Well, I I mean yeah I mean like in in its own way like it kind of it does the the Spider-Man versus Sinister Six thing in that 
you know, Spider-Man kind of like has always kind of, it seems like routinely dismantled the six one by one, you know, like they never seem to be able to just all attack him at once. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's always like, okay, first he take, but like, I thought it was, I actually did enjoy the structure of it because, you know, it's always, it always feels like, you know, Otto is the last piece to fall. And in this instance, you know, Goblin, you know, Spider Goblin takes him out first and does it kind of, you know, very cruelly, you know, and I, I guess that's it, too. It's like he's still taking them out one by one, but he's kind of doing it in, in the cruelest, most violent way possible. Um, so it is a it is a fun inversion on that on that trope, if you will, in terms of, you know, what every fight against the Sinister Six seems to be. Although I do think like it was during the um, Michelini Larson story that Electro turned Sandman into glass, right? I mean, I think it was in that instance it wasn't done to uh, by Spider-Man subduing Electro. It was like Electro you know, Sandman was like I think joining the fight for Spider-Man or something. But like we've seen that before. Like it, it was a trick we've seen before. I was like, oh okay. I was gonna uh, say like, have we seen that before? It seems like a no-brainer to like play those powers <laughs> off each other. And I couldn't. Re- I'm glad you remembered the specific story because, uh, like, it's such a cool beat. And I'm like, there's no way no one has done this before. Yeah, yeah. I think, it, like I said, I'm pretty sure it was the Larson Michelini, uh Sinister Six story. Um, but I mean, like, yeah. I mean, like, but it was fun. And like I said, I I, I liked the, I liked how they kind of inverted what we. Um, have uh typically done and then dan uh fun fun fact this uh you know stay tuned to my instagram uh for this but the amazing spider-man annual number one the 60th anniversary is this week so oh, you know wow. at, 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 you know so 60 60 years ago today these guys first joined up so there you go i'm surprised we didn't get a like a mention of that in the solicits from nick Lowe about how these issues were going to be better than Annual number one, um, but the uh, best Sinister Six story of all time since <laughs> since Peter Palmer. Uh, you know. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I love thought this battle was really fun. I, I'll, I'll tell you the Mysterio beat legit got me. Like the Avengers showing up, like the drawing was so cool. I didn't even like kind of bat an eye at the like outdated roster. Um, right, like with Miss Marvel I, I just and, her, that and, her, cool. and her thigh high boots and all that. I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, even just like the brutality of like taking the crowbar or whatever to um, Mysterio's you know, helm again. Um, but I thought the writing on each of the characters was really solid. Like Electro being like, "You'll never like you know like reduce my power." Feels very Electro, and even Craven mm-hmm. attacking. Uh, uh, the spider goblin and saying like these gadgets like demean you is very in character for Craven, who is always trying to go, you know, uh, mano a mano uh, without the, the use of technology. So like, I think Zeb did a great job of like writing and executing on the unique personalities of each member of the six, which I think is a good sign of someone who knows how to handle the writing of that team, so to speak. Uh, which often, like you mentioned, seems like more of a gathering than any kind of unified uh, grouping. Um, so I, I thought that was all great fun and um, and, and a good time. Um, okay, let's talk about, to me, the weakest part of this comic, which is the inclusion of like fan favorite, su- important supporting cast member, long legacy ASM, you know, crewmate, Kamala yeah. Khan. What did you yeah. think of this scene? Because this, to me, was really strange. Dan, fun fact, and I don't know what this means outside of either I I like was in a fugue state when I was reading it, or I maybe my pages were stuck together. But I actually, on the very very first read, skipped over the whole like that's not Norman Osborn part, which I don't know. I think it just speaks volumes to like the impact of this whole section. Um, but, um, I, I, I mean, am, am, am I, am I drawing weird analogies in life, Dan? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're bringing Kamala Khan back into this comic. Uh, we're, we're shoehorning her in must, I guess they can't kill her again though. Right. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, what, what's, what, what does it mean, Dan? Not after the news I broke, uh, but, um, uh, or at least broke on our podcast, but, uh, yeah, I, I, what do, I don't know if this is the right word for it, but it felt so, like, pedantic. 
like yeah. like getting into the weeds of or something that like why are we spending so much time on like this triviality like Kamala's like hey I'm try I can't get to Peter can you connect me with him which like we never find out what she wants from Peter so it just feels like an excuse to bring her in and then it's like let me just volunteer up calling you Mr. O, even though that's not the name that I call you as a way to find out if you're not Norman Osborn. And it's like, why would you do that unless you knew the result you were going to get? It's just a very awkwardly written scene uh, yes. that just screams of like, I have to communicate something. And the thing that's communicating, we already know, right? Mm -hmm. It's just that it's the goblin. Yeah, I guess. I mean, the only... I, I think, you know, Occam's razor, it's the it's the most obvious answer. I mean, there was a part of me that was like, are we insinuating there's a possibility that this is like a clone or something or, you know, a, yeah, a or like spies, the chameleon or something. I mean, that or would the be Queen goblin. Yeah, I don't know, Dan. I mean, like it it just felt out there. And like you said, it, it, it you know, I haven't seen kamala khan get forced into a story like this since she showed up for a job interview in uh issue 26 so i mean like you know i i, I you know maybe zeb is just trying to bring it all back I, I you know like i don't know what what purpose to serve in outside unless there truly is more of a twist going on than we're aware yeah, and I, I feel like this is an example of, like, Zeb's greatest weakness on this book. You know, like, we have com commended him for how he's able to, you know, manipulate all these stories into coalescing. And I think most of this issue is a great example of that, right? Like, I thought the chasm inclu inclusion made sense, the living brain, the, the sins of Norman. Like, it's all these stories coalescing. But then you get this thread with, like, Kamala Khan where it's like... Zeb, you haven't invested enough in this story for you to bring it back naturally in the way that you have. It feels like a like a vestigial tale, uh, you know, of storyline. And I would lump into that the black cat relationship or Mary Jane and Paul, like these stories that are going on ostensibly in this run, but we so rarely see that every time they come back and insist that they are core part of this run it feels so bizarre. Um, so we'll see where this goes, but right now it's like, it feels like that you don't need this many threads. You, you were fine. You were fine. Yeah. yeah. All right, Mark. Um, you know, anybody who is as integral to uh, a comic as Kamala Khan, you know, uh, you know, integral to our show is the spider slack. So why don't you tell our listeners about that? Longtime supporter of the Amazing Spider Talk podcast, The Spider Slack. That's because hundreds of listeners like you hang out in our community of Spider-Man fans on Slack. The Amazing Spider Slack community is absolutely free to join, and you can jump into active conversations with awesome people about collecting, conventions, movies, new comics, old comics, and more. Dan, what the heck is going on in the Slack this week? I mean, there's a lot going on in the Slack, but I'll highlight one conversation that's been fun, which is that we've been talking about, like, what would we want uh, that is conceivably realistic after the Zab Wells run concludes, which we all imagine, I think, at this point is around issue 60. And, you know, there's a lot of big shakeups going on at Marvel at the moment. We've got the X line completely handing over to a different editor and a different team of writers. And like, where are all those guys going to go? You know, there's been a bunch of, um, you know, books that, uh, you know, have been announced, but still some major writers uh, in the Marvel lineup that don't have titles uh, that have been announced yet. And so we've been kind of pulling all those things together and social media stuff to kind of begin speculating on like who or what could be taking over, uh, amazing Spider-Man uh, when Zeb Wells leaves and conceivably in the lead up to issue 1000, which I imagine whoever or whatever team of people take on the book are going to be on as a lead up to that special issue. Um, and so there's been a lot of names thrown out there and people's sub stacks have been hinting at changes. So um, it's been a fun place to speculate. So if you want to jump into that conversation and others like it, why don't you check out our amazing Slack? There's a link in the description of this episode that'll let you sign up in less than a minute and come in, join us for our friendly community 
that is fairly non-toxic or almost completely non-toxic. And that's what we love it about it. So speaking of toxic, uh, the mind of chasm is thrown asunder in the opening pages of this issue in a spread that I thought was really cool seeing like all the different spider people in the Winkler device. Hey, uh, what do you think of chasm's brief inclusion in this issue, Mark? Um, this might have been my favorite, um, chasm appearance since, um, he became chasm. I, I, I like it, 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 I, I felt it was well dropped in, you know, like everything made sense. You know, we, 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 it was a good payoff to, um, the, the story we got, you know, in between this and the blood hunt tie in. I mean, not that I was expecting them to completely drop it but like i'm glad that they they brought it back as quickly as they did i i i I didn't want to you know i think it would have felt a little wasted if we got too many installments into this arc before like the chasm kind of of it all appeared um and you know like i saw some people online kind of criticizing the whole like oh maybe i'm here to say help or not i don't know but like i look man this is just who the character is right now it's not the Ben Riley of the nineties. So you got to move on from that, you know, sorry. Uh, I felt like within the realm of the character that was created, this was a, this was a good use of the character. He seems far more sympathetic, you know, yeah. like even just from the opening page where he is like alarmed about what Peter has been experiencing. And, you know, I don't really know that I fully understand like what was, uh, return to him from being in the Winkler device other than like getting those brief glimpses into Peter's memory, whether there is more of Peter back in uh, him or, you know, I'll leave it to Zeb Wells to, to you know, flush it out, yeah. flush it out or <laughs> invent it issue by issue and change the rules constantly. Um, but it does seem like he at least is moving closer towards having a goal. What his role in this will be? I don't know. Um, but it does seem like a fun way to go. And especially when you get Ed McGinnis drawing him on that final page, this is a really cool drawing, uh, or illustration rather, but, um, you know, he, it's a cool suit design, whether I can square this with the interpretation of chasm that was trying to take over Manhattan in dark (laughs) web and all that stuff. I don't think so, but the less said about that guy, I think the better, so like maybe this like I, I'm optimistic that this seems like it could be a way for him to redeem Chasm a bit before closing the door on the run, and I'm all here for that. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I I've said this before in other storylines on this podcast. When when we get like character beats like this, it's kind of like the pro wrestling of 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 superhero comics. You know what I mean? Like it's it. Look, we're telling you alignments are changing. Just go with it, and you know, it, it, yeah, you would like something more elegant and graceful, but you know, then again, it's, it's chasm. What are you expecting at this point? I mean, you know, like the character, the character is subtle as a jackhammer. So, um, let's just, yeah. I, I pro wrestling is probably the, like the right thing to compare like any Ed McGinnis issue to, you know, it's yeah. like we're at, we're asking you to take it seriously, but we all know how silly this is. And characters show up willy nilly here and there and defy time and space. And, and anything from before and you could call that bad comics and, and and maybe they are, but like there's something kind of fun in the wink, wink, nudge, nudge of it all. Um, what do you think about the walking brain? He gets a few pages here and Todd knock returns, which I actually thought was a fairly um, like easy transition from Ed McGinnis's artwork. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. I really, not that I couldn't tell the difference, but yeah, it's a good, it's a good transition. I mean, I don't know, man, like this whole thing is just like, I mean, first of all, it's like, it's moving at a, at a very glacial pace in terms of like, where is this all leading to? But I get it. It's like these like connecting epilogues. I, I, I have to admit, I don't love the epilogue structure here. Like if we're ending the comic and the comic, like, like this has never been, I, I mean, there, there was like one epilogue in amazing Spider-Man history that I could point to that was functional. And that was like the Peter Mary Jane closing the door 
uh, epilogue in Amazing Spider-Man number 122. This is not a moment of that kind of magnitude or gravity, so I don't know why we're doing epilogues here. Uh, I, I so. would say on the scale of Mary Jane closing the door to, I think the lowest bar is like the slow reveal of Craven from the start of the Nick Spencer run. Fair, uh, yeah. Like, th- this is mo- closer to the MJ thing than the Craven thing. Like, it's fun. Like, I-, I thought the final reveal page of Jonah, like, correcting the bugle angrily, sitting yes. next to the arms of the octopus. It- so silly, like, character-breaking level silly, but such a wild image that I'm like, all right, like, I, I can take an issue that just gives me that in an epilogue. Like, I, I, I found it fairly inoffensive, if utterly confusing as to, like, who J. Jonah Jameson is as a person anymore. Which, right. like, granted, I don't know that the comic has any idea what to do with that character now that he knows Spidey's identity. Um, but, like, as in terms of a visual, I'll take an epilogue that was just that visual. All right, fair enough. I, I, I mean, it, it was... It was silly, but like I, I was just like, what, like, why do we keep doing this with these characters? And it's, it's always like a living brain thing. But okay, fine, it's fine, whatever. What, what do you suspect is going? I mean, you seem to have written like you think Jonah is entering the battle. Like, are we going to get a five armed Doctor Connors? You know, like, 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 no. what, like, what, what are, what are we getting here? Do we think like that this five is just arms. a way? Because like Otto's arms were dismantled. Like maybe there's a way to restore Otto. Uh, you know, with the arms here. Oh yeah, give him his old um his old contraption back. You're saying instead of you know like, it's probably he probably like the OG Otto would probably stand a better chance against this version of Spider Man because he can't get out teched by him. You know what I mean? It's not a so so maybe um yeah. I mean, I just figured like they were gonna bring Jonah and the arms into the fray, but then you know Jonah eventually would kind of you know. Back Pass out somehow. or something. Yeah, the yeah. arms would fall back in love with Otto for whatever reason. Um, right, right. This to me felt like a like putting the pieces back. Like you destroy the new Otto arms, you reintroduce the old ones by the end of the issue, and somehow those lovers will reunite in, in, in some way. Um, and maybe Otto will be allowed to like get his mojo back after being destroyed by the Spider Goblin so quickly. You know, he's got to restore his status as number two or number right. one villain of Spidey by the or, uh, uh, you know, uh, by taking down the goblin or something by the end of the story. Who knows? Um, Mark, grades. Why don't you start us off this week? Uh, what do you think of this issue? I'm, I'm going to give this a C plus. I think it's it's a shade above average. Um, there were fun moments. I, I still don't love the idea of the characterization of spider goblin here, it feels a little repetitive, but like, I didn't dislike it either. You? Yeah. I I'm somewhere right around there. C plus B minus let's say C plus for uniformity. I had a fun time with this. I think the art elevates it and makes it really fun, but it's a fairly standard rock'em sock'em punching issue of Spider-Man with attractive art. Um, so I think something we've gotten a lot of uh, over the years, um, but done fairly elegantly. All right, Mark. Well, why don't you take us home? Sounds good, Dan. It's that time. Time for all good things to come to an end. So we want to say thank you to you, the listeners and viewers, for tuning in to this episode of The Amazing Spider Talk. Yeah, this podcast exists because of listener support on Patreon. For only $3.99 a month, you can help support our show's existence while getting early episodes, including these reviews the same weeks the comics release, exclusive artwork, and a ton of other bonuses. So thank you to everyone who already supports us and the work that we do. Dan and I really want to increase all the awesome work we do in the second half of 2024. So if you're already a patron or want to become one, Please help us to meet our goals and make this a better podcast by considering supporting our show. Just go to AmazingSpiderTalk.com and click on the big Patreon button to get started. Just imagine all the cool things Mark and I can do now that we're going to be on the same coast as each other. Like, I think convention appearances and other Patreon goodies are going to be much easier to come by with us in the same time zone or within three hours of each other. Um, or maybe, so th- or maybe just meet for breakfast, Dan. I mean, whatever. No, that's it. That's it. Yeah, come meet us for breakfast. Uh, There's that good uh, that, that good diner in Annapolis. Uh, oh, was the, that that? 
I, the there is place. that, but I was going to say, you can come and we'll give you a bagel tour, uh, especially if you're from Canada. Ooh. Ah, uh, maybe not. Anyway, keep going. <laughs> Don't forget to subscribe to our amazing Spider Talk Substack. We're almost at 1,000 subscribers, and we'd love to have you help push us over that hump. That would be really cool. We're covering all of Ultimate Spider-Man there, especially as that finishes up its first arc. So that's amazingspider.substack.com. There's also a link to that in the description for this episode. So, Mark... Until you learn the truth about Santa Claus, what's our motto? With great podcasts, there must also come the amazing spider talk. Now I'm imagining like that uh, amazing Spider-Man 300 cover with Santa Claus in the middle. And it just says, ho, 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 ho around him. Uh, you know, that would be that would be ideal. Oh, my God. The dad jokes for me tonight, Dan, are just something to behold. I've been spending a lot of time with my son. There you go. 